I'm Stephen Scheuer, welcoming you to another in our series of oral histories in which we are fortunate indeed to be able to interview those persons who have helped shape the style and substance of television and our major media today. We're grateful to have Mr. Hewitt with us today, February 12th, 2001, at New York's Coffee House Club, since he is not only deeply involved in the day-to-day -day mandate of nurturing, developing stories, and signing off on the weekly broadcast, particularly during the February sweeps, but also he's been publishing his latest autobiographical work, Tell Me a Story, and now I'm sure Mr. Hewitt will, in this quite extraordinary fashion, as he does every week as executive producer of 60 Minutes. Welcome, Don. I want to quit while I'm ahead, you know? <laughs> <laughs> February is sweeps month, so let me ask this. Do you ever have a self-imposed or a network-imposed mandate of juicing up the hour in sweeps to ensure that no other broadcaster cable interlopers would challenge your long and well-earned ratings dominance. Or like Rhett Butler, it is a case of, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn about sweeps. The latter. I don't even know when, you know something? You just told me something I wasn't even aware of. I never think about sweeps. I guess we're unique. We must be the only broadcast in television that no one has ever asked us to do anything for a sweeps week. I think it is probably a crime against the American people. Sweeps week is a ridiculous idea. How it ever came about is beyond me. And that advertisers are stupid enough to believe that what you load up a sweeps week with is indicative of the rest of the month or the rest of the year is beyond me how they ever fell for it. I mean, I would think that the Ford Motor Company spends more money and more time deciding whether they're going to use what shade of green in their car than spending the money they spend in television based on this inane Sweeps Week. Let me, uh, you brought up Sweeps Week. I, my favorite story about Sweeps Week is how it certainly doesn't make for elevating television. Many years ago, not so many years ago, the big sweeps week story at ABC was not Pol Pot coming out of the jungle. It was Ellen DeGeneres coming out of the closet. And I dare say that they didn't care whether she came out or stayed in, as long as she did it during a sweeps week. And that's no rap at ABC, because it would have happened the same thing at NBC or CBS. So, <laughs> so no, much. I have never, ever, I've never seen a minute by minute uh, Nielsen. I, as all these other guys do. Where did you peak? Where did you not? I, I have no interest in it. Never, see, never been for a focus group in all the years in television, which makes us unique. That's terrific. How much did William Paley and today Mel Carmison care about sweeps? Uh, I have never met a or television ratings. executive who doesn't agree with me that it's a kind of a Mickey Mouse way of deciding what you're going to put on the air. Um, and yet they're stuck with it. I, don't, I can't figure out why guys as smart as that haven't figured a way out of it. Paley, our relationship was very unique. Uh, we were best friends by the time he died. Uh, my wife and I were in the room with him the night he died. Uh, the great thing about Bill Paley, Bill Paley was, on one hand, P.T. Barnum, on the other, Henry Luce. He gave America Edward R. Morrow, Eric Severide, Charles Collingwood, Walter Cronkite, 60 Minutes, CBS Reports, and Alan Alda, Lucille Ball, Jackie Gleason, Red Skelton. Nobody else in history, I think, had ever played that kind of a role in both camps. And he decided that if you keep them separate, two 
towers with no bridge between them. A Lucille ball will rub off on an Ed Morrow, and an Ed Morrow will rub off on a Lucille ball, and they will both be giants. The wall that's used to separate news and entertainment doesn't exist anymore. However, all of us who work in news have no problem climbing over the rubble to the other side to get an entertainment-sized paycheck every week so that there's a little bit of hypocrisy in guys in our business who complain that it's all so commercial now. And I say, of course it's commercial. Where do you think they get the money to pay us? I mean, I have people who work for me who complain about too many commercials. I said, you're represented by William Morris. Where do you think they're going to get the money? And when you realize I, Jennings, Brokaw, rather, we make more than Ed Morrow ever dreamed of making. So we're really not in a position to, to complain about the commercialization. Growing up years in New Rochelle, New York, yeah. Great. and tell us what what kind of town was it? What kind of youngster were you? Tell us about mm -hmm. your parents. Who was Donald Hewitt then? I was a kid who I think when I was four years old, I was playing reporter. I don't know why. Other kids were playing cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians. I wanted to be a reporter more than anything in the world. I, I have no idea why. Um, I grew up, New Rochelle was sort of, it really, you couldn't call it small town America because there were 60,000 people there. It seemed to me everybody in town knew everybody else. You did small town things, you joined the Boy Scouts, you marched in the 4th of July parade, you played baseball in an empty lot. Um, they used to walk along the railroad tracks and watch the uh, the 20th century and the Merchants Limited come barreling through on the way to and from Boston and you'd wave to the people in the dining cars. It was, it, it had everything that a small town had without, after all, it was 45 minutes from Broadway. George M. Cohen wrote about it. It, um, and I just knew. Almost, I don't, I don't know how I knew. Um, my father was in the business end. He had been the classified advertising manager of the Boston Herald American and the Wisconsin News. We lived in Boston. We lived in Milwaukee. So I wasn't really driven by that. You know what I wanted more than else in the world? I wanted a trench coat <laughs> and I wanted a hat with a, with a uh, press badge in it and a pipe. I always thought a pipe was part of being a reporter. Did you see Jill McRae and Foreign Correspondent? Foreign Correspondent. <laughs> Listen, that's what I wanted to be more than anything in the world. Now, I wrote for the high school paper. I, I don't think I was all that good. I wrote a, a sports column. had a great title, but it wasn't what, the title was Athlete's Footnotes. And um, aside from the column, I remember my advisor saying, you know, you're not all this good in this business. You want to think about something else. Well, I don't want to think about anything else. And the first job I ever had, in the, I, I was the high school correspondent for the local paper, the North Shell Standard Star. And I was in the sixth grade, and I won a prize for an editorial in Scholastic. I mean, we used to get all the Scholastics came to school. And I wrote an editorial, Press Drives Lindbergh to Self-Exile. It's the first time I began to realize maybe the press was too big for its boots. We'll talk about that, too. And so I, I won this prize, and I just, it kind of, it was an impetus. It was kind of moving me toward what I wanted to be. So that I went to NYU on a track scholarship. I was captain of the track team at Nurse Show High School. What were you running? What was your event? Sprinter. And Emil von Elling was the coach, and I figured if I'm going to make the Olympic team, this guy's the best track coach in America, and that's why I wanted to go there. I flunked out. I had no interest in a college education. I wanted to work for a newspaper. And I'd met a guy many years before who would name Arthur Perrin, who was the assistant sports editor of the Herald Tribune. He said, if you ever want a job, come around and see me. At that point, everybody's being drafted. 
okay? <laughs> all the guys at the Herald Tribune and the Times, copy boys, <clears throat> were all Harvard, Yale, Princeton. I'm this jerky kid who <laughs> flunked out of NYU. What? They're desperate. Guys are being drafted left and right. I went to work for the Herald Tribune. I walked in there. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It looked like the movie Front Page. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, and I'm, I'm running copy for Marguerite Higgins, who won a, a Pulitzer, and Homer Bickert, and uh, Red Smith was Red on the Smith. thing, and uh, Tex O'Reilly was, and I, I, I look at this thing and I'm thinking, I'm going to sleep and I awakened on a movie set. I went to the Merchant Marine Academy as a cadet, and after six weeks you go to sea. And I'm in a convoy, St. Patrick's Eve, 1943, 40 ships. I'm a cadet on one of the ships. We run into a wolf pack of German subs. Convoy gets practically wiped out. I think we were the only ones still, I mean, they were going down left and right around us. Um, all I remember is ha at the academy, you used to every morning go out and do a lifeboat drill on the sound. So cold, your hands used to freeze to the oars. All I could think was, God, I hope they hit us midships and we go right down. I don't want to get in a lifeboat and freeze to death. So the next morning, the convoys dispersed. The, the escort ships are gone. We're all alone in the North Atlantic. And all of a sudden, there are two dots on the horizon. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. The two RAF planes coming out of Scotland to escort us in. I had only one reaction that I remember. Where's the music? <laughs> I've been in the movies all my life, right? You can't get rescued without music. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> scored this thing. <laughs> Dimitri Tiomkin, right? <laughs> Where is the score? That's how much I was a kid of the movies. I get to London. I go around the Stars and Stripes office. And uh, I knew a couple of guys who worked there. Stars and Stripes was the U.S. US Army, Army front newspaper. Line newspaper. Bob Mura, who had been in the Herald Tribune, was the editor. The co-editor was a guy named Bud Hutton. They said, we need a merchant marine editor here. And the major in charge writes this letter back to Washington, how desperately they need a merchant marine editor. They didn't. <laughs> it was okay. great. I talked them into it. I eventually end up in London. I'm 20 years old. I'm the youngest war correspondent I credited the Eisenhower headquarters, and it's like during World War I, Mort, there was a, a great show called Oh, What a Lovely War, which yeah. how people were living in London during World War I. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed to tell you this, but World War II was Oh, What a Lovely War, as far as I was concerned. I'd go out with the RAF on anti-sub patrols. I'd go out with the British Navy on hunt-class destroyers looking for German e-boats in the North Sea come home, change your clothes, and go tea dancing at Claridge's. I mean, it was over a lovely war. I got a flat in London. There are broads like you can't believe it, showgirls. I mean, it, the whole thing was like, it was like the movie Yank and the RAF. I couldn't believe. And then came D-Day, and I had this incredible assignment. I went up to Scotland. I was told to go up there, there would be a Navy lieutenant would meet me at Oban, Scotland. And he takes me down to the port, and there is a convoy of ships, all of them riding high in the water. And I'm saying, wait a minute, they got no cargo, no troops. What are we going to do on these things? Secret orders. We sail out of Scotland. The captain opens the orders in the bridge and calls me up and says, you know where we're going? So he said, we're going to Normandy. You know what we're going to do? These ships are loaded with dynamite. We're going to blow them up and make the breakwater for the invasion. We get to Cherbourg, or off Cherbourg, but actually the Normandy beach, and we're about 100 yards off the beach, and it's D plus one. They've just come in. All hell breaks loose. I mean, there, <laughs> there's a war going on. Here I've been <laughs> living the life of Riley. And they take us off in LSTs before they blow the ship. And we start to turn around and head back to a, another ship that's going to take us back to England. And I said to the guy in LST, wait, wait, go to the beach. What? I said, go to the beach. I got out, tapped my foot on the sand, and I said, let's get out of here. I just wanted that I was there. Um, 
it was it was an incredible timing. It almost I look back on it almost like it was out of a movie. And then I ended up from there. I went back and I went out to the Pacific. Now this is you want to talk about growing up in New Rochelle. My best friend, a kid named Bobby Whitelaw, and I are in the woods in New Rochelle, popping tin cans with a BB gun. We come out. We stop at a uh, gas station on a Sunday afternoon to get warm. It's cold. It's December. It's December 7th. And the guy in the gas station says, you guys better learn how to use those things. I said, why? He said, the Japs just bombed Pearl Harbor. Now, this is my friend Bobby Whitelaw and I. We're there, told better learn how to get use one of those guns. The Japs just bombed Pearl Harbor. I went to Saipan and visited his grave. The kid I was with, su Sunday afternoon, December 7th, 1941, was killed by a sniper on Saipan. He was a Marine. The war sort of came full circle to me. You come back from the war to the Herald Tribune, presuming you're going to be treated like <laughs> yeah, a well, Hail the Conquering that's Hero. That's right. And they said, you were great. You had a great Oregon. Your old job is waiting for you. And it doesn't pay $15 a week anymore. It now pays 25 <laughs> So I figured, oh my god. What I really wanted was, I wanted to work for the Paris edition. I mean, that to me was the dream. Well, Eric Hawkins, who was editor of the Paris Herald in those days, didn't have the same dream I had. And I came home, and I wasn't going to be the foreign correspondent I wanted to be. So I figured, I'm not going back to the Herald Tribune as a copy boy. So I go over to the AP, and I get hired as a night editor of the AP Bureau in Memphis. And I file a tri-state wire, which is Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi. In those days, AP never had their own telegraphers. You had to file your own copy. The bureau chief for the state from Nashville comes over one day, and he says to me, look, we think you're dynamite. We think you got great potential, you're terrific, well, we may have to let you go. I said, why? He said, the typos. All <laughs> every client of the AP complains, your stories are full of so many typos, again, they had a tail of it. I said, I can't, I never learn how to type. I'm a two-finger guy. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. So I almost lost my job over typos, but after a while, but he said, let me tell you something. I'm not going to make any promises. You're bright and you're wonderful, and I'm not going to promise you, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that someday you could go to Nashville. I mean, we could, you could get a job there. I said, oh, that's pretty good. He said, now, it's, it, 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 it's happened, not very often, but we've had guys move from Nashville to Atlanta. I figured, uh-oh, I'm going to get my way back to New York through every tank town in the South. <laughs> I said, i got to get out of here. By this time, I get married. So we head back, and I come back to the Pelham Sun, where I'd work when I was a copy boy at the Herald Tribune. I worked days at the Pelham Sun, weekly, nights at the Herald Tribune. And I went back and got the job as editor of the Pelham Sun, um, which was great experience, because you not only covered everything and edited everything, I used to go in and set type. You know, you, there was no union shop. You mm -hmm. go in in the composing room, and in those days, it was you know, you pick type out of a, or a line of type machine. No typos, though, I was learning. <laughs> From there I went to, a guy walked in one day who lived in Pelham named Boyd Lewis. He was executive editor of NEA News. Boyd came in one day and he said, I've been looking at the newspaper, it's pretty damn good. You want to work for me? I said, doing what? He said, I need a night telephoto editor. Acme News Pictures was the picture end of United Press. It wasn't even UPI then. It was United Press. It was still international news. I went there, and uh, pretty good job. Kind of musty and work nights, and it was down the, and it was in the Garment District, 461 8th mm -hmm. Avenue. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, that's where CNN is now. And one day, I have a friend, Bobby Rogo. Bobby calls me, and he says, listen, you know a lot about pictures. I said, yeah, I'm editing pictures. He said, CBS is looking for a guy with picture experience. I said, just the best. What would a radio, this is 1948, a radio network want with a guy with picture experience? He said, no, television. 
I said, what a vision? He said, television. I said, they don't have that. He said, they got it. I said, that's Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon. He said, no, no. I said, what? He, he said, it's upstairs. They have a studio over Grand Central. Go look. I walk in. It's like, I, I went through that station every day. I never knew up in the attic there was this place where all these toys were. I walk in. There are lights and makeup men and costume designers and television cameras. And I figured, I'm a kid who never knew whether he wanted to be Hildy Johnson in Front Page or Julian Marsh in the movie 42nd. 42nd Street. I take one look and I say, my God, you can be both of them here. You can be both guys. And I got the job. Now, this is 1948. I go back to Acme and I said to Boyd Lewis, well, I'm going to leave. He said, for what? I said, television. He said, television? He said, that's a fad. That won't last. He was half right. It is a fad, but it lasted. And all of a sudden, I took a $20 a week cut from $100 a week to $80 a week. And I sometimes wake up with cold chills. God, how close I came to saying, I can't take a $20 a week cut. I got two kids. I'm married. I did it. Now, when I came into television, it was the early days, I'm associate director. One day I get made a director. You know who the kids were who were working for me? Sidney Lumet, Johnny Frankenheimer, another guy, Ewell Brenner is there. Now all these guys went to Hollywood. They said, you know, Sidney and Frankenheimer became big names in Hollywood. <laughs> Ewell Brenner became the king of Siam. And I, I stayed there. Now I got another guy who comes. He's worked, there are two of us doing the Doug Edwards news. It's a guy named Frank Schaffner. One day Frank decides he's going to Hollywood. He made Patton, Nicholas and Alexandra, Papillon. He used to call me once a week and say, come out here. You'd love it. <laughs> I said, listen, Frank, I don't know stage right from stage left. I'd be petrified. I'm going to stay here, and maybe something good will happen. But you became both Julian and? Both Julian Marsh and, and Hildy. Hildy Johnson. Still am. Doug Edwards in the news, right? Yep. That was, what, a 15 minute? Fit for 15 minutes for Rosemadeel. Now, it was before videotape. So we did it 6.45 to 7. A lot of times we'd run over. We'd get hell all the time. We would run over 7.6, seven, 7.8. Seven, Today you run over, a computer will take you off the air. 1948, nobody knew what a computer was. Who ever heard of a computer? What you had to do was, 6.45 you'd do the show, no videotape. You'd come back at 9.45 and do it for the West Coast. Now what do you do between 7 and 9.45? We went to the Hudson Burlesque in Union City every night <laughs> because <laughs> you go somewhere to waste <laughs> the time. So Doug and I were at regulars <laughs> backstage at the, at the Hudson Theater in Union City. Then you come back and you do the repeat. Another great thing happened. It's before teleprompters. You used to have a big cute card. You'd, you'd write out the script, you'd hold it up there so the guy wouldn't have to look down at his script. And I had this idea, which today I still think is a great idea, and people think I'm nuts. Learn Braille. If you learn Braille, and your script is in Braille, you can look at the camera and run your hand over the script without a window. Everybody said, that's the stupidest thing. I said, that's not stupid. I am willing to bet if nobody had invented a teleprompter, today, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, and Peter Jennings would be doing their scripts in Braille so they could do this and still look at a, at a camera. That's a good idea, which I trust you've copyrighted. No, they don't need it anymore. Teleprompters done away with it. You also created some other things, like uh, lower thirds, did you not? There were other you mean, innovations. You mean, you mean the first superimposition? Yep. OK, this is the way this happened. We're at the 1952 Democratic Convention in Chicago. And this is the problem. You always have to lower the audio for Cronkite to come in and say, that's uh, Bob Taft, that's Nelson Rockefeller sitting over there, that's Terry. And I said, 
if we could only superimpose the names, we wouldn't have to lower the audio. But you can't set type fast enough before the shot's gone. I'm having breakfast in a diner in Chicago. And the waitress comes over. I'm sitting at the counter, and she says, what do you have? I said, I, I look up. And there's a board up there. It's got a little white that says, soup, 35 cents, hamburgers, 40 cents. I said, that board. She said, what? I said, I'd like to buy that board. She must have thought I was nuts. She calls the manager, and he says, what is it you want? I said, I want to buy that board from you, the porter. I paid him $45 for the board and 50, I think 10 or $15 for the letters. I went back to the studio. I said, look at this. You set this thing up. It's white on black superimposes. You set up the board. If you can write S-O-U-P, 35 cents, you can write Rockefeller by putting R-O-C-K <laughs> in. We solved the super problem. Now, the other thing that came out of that <laughs> convention was one of the dumbest words in the English language. Anchor man. People to this day think it's something to do with boats. Nothing to do with boats. We're sitting around the stockyards in. Sig Mickelson, who was president of CBS News, actually was vice president of the company in charge of CBS News, one of my favorite guys of all times. A guy named Paul Levitan, who murdered the English language, and I'll tell you some of those stories, which are just great. Um, we're sitting around the stockyards in. How are we going to do this? And I said, well, it'll be like a relay team. It'll be Quincy Howe, who was a great broadcaster, John Daly, who became president of ABC News, Doug Edwards, who was doing the evening news then, and Cronkite. But Cronkite was sort of be the anchor man of the relay team. The Lynch handed off like a baton, but Cronkite will run the anchor leg, be the main guy. The name stuck. Anchor man, nothing to do with boats. I dare say, I'm going to put that in my book, and I dare say that until they read it, there are anchor men all over the country who have no idea what anchor man means. <laughs> the derivation. Nothing. Uh -huh. In fact, it's so silly, it's such a stupid <laughs> word, that anchor men who go out on stories are called floating anchors. Now, I said, as I said, Walter became not an anchor man, he became the anchor man. You're directing the show, Murrow McCarthy Night. Mm -hmm. And I read Friendly's take on that night. I'd like to hear first person, primary source from you. Primary source except because I was always pictured sitting alongside Ed because we did it from a control room, I think I got a lot more credit for See It Now than I deserve. I'm sort of the traffic cop. I'm the director. This is friendly and morose broadcast. It may be television's proudest moment. Because a report on Senator McCarthy is by definition controversial, we want to say exactly what we mean to say. And I request your permission to read from script whatever remarks Murrow and Friendly may make. If the senator feels that we have done violence to his words or pictures, and desires, so to speak, to answer himself, an opportunity will be afforded him on this program. Our working thesis tonight is this quotation. If this fight against communism is made a fight between America's two great political parties, the American people know that one of these parties will be destroyed, and the republic cannot endure very long as a one-party system. We applaud that statement, and we think Senator McCarthy ought to. He said it 17 months ago in Milwaukee. The American people realize that this cannot be made a fight between America's two great political parties. If this fight against communism is made a fight between America's two great political parties, the American people know that one of those parties will be destroyed and the Republic can't endure very long as a one-party system. But on February 4th, 1954, Senator McCarthy spoke of one party's treason. This was Charleston, West Virginia. Where there were no cameras running, it was recorded on tape. The issue between Republicans and Democrats is clearly drawn. It has been deliberately drawn by those who have been in charge of 20 years of treason. Now, the hard fact is, the hard fact is that those who wear the label, those who wear the label Democrats, 
were with the stain of a historic betrayal. The actions of the junior senator from Wisconsin have caused alarm and dismay amongst our allies abroad and given considerable comfort to our enemies. And whose fault is that? Not really his. He didn't create this situation of fear. He merely exploited it, and rather successfully. Cassius was right. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Marlowe and Friendly decided to come to grips with a terrible problem in America. And it was the first time you realized that how powerful this medium was. It, it killed Joe McCarthy. Dead. Um, the, by just playing, just playing out the rope. And they deserve the greatest credit in the world for maybe the single moment that television can point to with the most pride. Now, Ed, this is a great story. Ed is in uh, Israel with Moish Diane, and Diane is driving him to an airstrip to come home. And he said, you know, Morrow, you can get credit for America's great participation in World War II. You, your broadcast from London is what brought everybody into this war. He said, oh, generally, he said there was Shira, and there was Howard K. Smith, and there was, he said, I got too much credit for that. And Diane, they drove a little further, and Diane said, well, he said, your documentary you did, Christmas in Korea, it's one of the best I ever saw. And I said, oh, generally, he said that was Joe Wershba and Eddie Scott and Friendly, and I got too much credit for that. And Diane, <laughs> word. he said, well, I'll tell you one thing, you, actually brought down Joe McCarthy. And I said, no, there were other guys doing it. Shire was doing it, and there were other broadcasters. Diane never said another word. They get to the airport. Ed gets out of the Jeep, they say goodbye, and he heads up the steps to go in the plane. Gets to the top, and Diane was down at the bottom and says, Oro! <laughs> he said, yes, sir, what is it? He said, don't be so modest. You're not that good. <laughs> I thought it was a, like a, a, a classic night, Nixon-Kennedy, first debate, first appearance of the two candidates in television. I'm the producer, director, big night. In this, the first discussion in a series of four uh, joint appearances, the subject matter has been agreed will be restricted to internal or domestic American matters. And now for the first opening statement by Senator John F. Kennedy. Smith, Mr. Nixon. In the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. In the election of 1960 and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist half slave or half free. We heard tonight, for example, the statement made that our growth in national product last year was the lowest of any industrial nation in the world. Now, last year, of course, was 1958. That happened to be a recession year. But when we look at the growth of GNP this year, a year of recovery, we find that it's six and nine tenths percent and one of the highest in the world today. That's the night that television and politics realize they can't do without each other. That could be the ruin of American democracy. Because of that night, the number one qualification to hold office in the greatest democracy on earth is an ability to raise money. And the ability to raise money is only because of television. It cost the Democratic National Committee $2.2 million. In today's terms, that's $26 million to get Franklin Roosevelt elected President of the United States. Schumer and D'Amato spent more than that on television for one Senate seat. It is so out of hand. It is so crazy. And they keep talking about campaign reform. And campaign reform is all about money for television. 
That's all it's about. And I keep saying, suppose neither one of them spent a penny. Isn't that a level playing field? And they say, well, yeah, one's an incumbent and one's not. I said, no, no. George Bush was an incumbent governor. McCain was an incumbent senator. They spent God knows how much money during a primary. If they hadn't spent a penny, it's still a level playing field. It's about, look at the trouble that Bill Clinton is in now. It's all about fundraising. It's all, every, that America has come down to how much money can you raise? And if you can't raise money, don't even think about running for office in this country. It's television's fault. It, it is, I think, a crime. Now, they keep throwing the First Amendment at us. Well, you can't deny them the right to buy it. It's a violation of the First Amendment. Mm, how do what? you answer that? the Founding Fathers would turn over in their graves if they knew what was being done in their name. The First Amendment is, we have so bastardized what I think the purpose of the First Amendment was, not to get in the way of the free dissemination of information. And you can use that as a justification why you have to sell television time to a politician. I, I, I think that's a... We in this country prided ourselves. This country will be built on people being freely elected. Nobody is freely elected. They're expensively elected. You cannot be freely elected. You can't even think about running for office unless you can get the money up. And it all came out of, I'm a little ashamed to say, something I had a hand in. The night of the Nixon-Kennedy debate was the first night that television and politics said, oh my God, I'll tell you the, the main problem. We got married, television and politics. They married us for love, we married them for money, and it is a disaster for democracy. Didn't know it that night, thought it was a great night, it wasn't. And what does most of America remember about that night? Makeup, and I'll tell you some great P.S. stories. I asked them both whether they wanted any makeup. Kennedy, I have this great makeup lady there, Frances Arbo. Is this Arbo. the first time you met Kennedy? Or no, Nixon? I met him in a hangar at Midway Airport a week before. He came and stopped because he wanted to know where do I look, where do I stand, how much time do I have. He was very curious. I never saw Nixon before the debate. He just arrived. Looked sallow, he had a staphylococcus infection, he banged his knee on the car, he was in bad shape. He needed makeup. I said to him, Do you want any makeup? Kennedy, who was, looked like Lockenvoir, for Christ's sake, <laughs> this, this handsome matinee idol, uh, well tailored, tan, fit, been campaigning in California in an open convertible, looked great, said, No, thank you, I don't think I want it. Nixon, who needed it, heard him say no, figured, if I have makeup, they'll say one was made up, one wasn't. So they take Nixon off in an office, his guys, they make him up with something called shave stick, this, the cover of beard. Comes out, looks like death warmed over. I take one look at him on camera, and I call Frank Stanton into the control room, then president of CBS. I said, Frank, you better tell me, look at this, I think we got trouble here. He looks at him, he says, uh-oh. We go to a guy named Ted Rogers, who's his television advisor. Are you satisfied with the way your man looks? He says, oh yeah, it looks fine to me. Stanton calls me aside and says, that's none of our business. If their guys like it, we can't change it. It's not our, if they didn't like it, we could do something. That election turned on. People who heard on radio thought Nixon won. But most people watching on television, Kennedy's the clear winner. Why? Because he looks better. So I said, it's like Miss America. You're gonna, the better looking guy's gonna win, which is a lousy way to pick a president. We may have picked the right one, but for the wrong reasons. Now, Kennedy gets assassinated, and we're doing a JFK memorial show. I'm sitting in a makeup room with Richard Nixon. Francis Arvold, who I brought to Chicago that night, is in there making him up. I said, you know, Mr. Nixon, if Franny had made you up the night of the first debate, you'd have been president now. Without a hesitation, 
he says to me, yeah, I'd be dead now, too. Nineteen sixty. Two guys named Huntley and Brinkley. I figured, where did these guys come from? I mean, I felt like I was run over by a steamroller. Um, in fact, you, you remember in um, what was the movie with with uh, uh, Redford and Newman, the two bounty hunters that chased them? Who are those guys? Butch Cassidy, the Sundance. Butch Cassidy. And I see these two, and I figured, where did these guys come from? And I panic, and I go to Mickelson, and I say, we got to do something. Let's team Ed Morrow and Walter Cronkite against Huntley and Brink. Disaster. What you've got are two violinists, both of them mm. sensational as soloists. Couldn't carry a tune as a duet. They got in each other's way. It did not work. You would think Ed Morrow and Walter Cronkite was the answer to Huntley and Brinkley. It was a disaster. And I was responsible for it. One day, Ed decided, if he's ever going to take care of his wife and kids and make a decent living, it ain't would see it now. So he starts a broadcast called Person to Person, in which he visits fe famous people at home, Marilyn Monroe, he's going to look in Marilyn Monroe's closet. And there was a guy named John Horn at the uh, Herald Tribune, and he coined a great phrase about the two Morrow broadcasts. He called one of them High Morrow and Low Morrow. And I said, oh my God, that's the answer. I'm going to put High Morrow and Low Morrow in the same broadcast. And it worked. 60 Minutes is High Morrow and Low Morrow. Last night, Morley Safer's story with the, that mean sheriff is Low Morrow. The story from Africa is High Morrow. I said, if you mix them up in one broadcast, you can't miss. Good evening. This is 60 Minutes. It's a kind of a magazine for television which means it has the flexibility and diversity of a magazine adapted to broadcast journalism. And our first cover story is about cops by the top cop. Chances are that you were watching television when they were balloting at the Republican convention. So was the man who won that nomination. And a 60 Minutes cameraman was there, the only television cameraman in the room. He was there also when the Democratic nominee watched his moment of glory, also exclusive. In the regular section we call Viewpoint, tonight three guest columnists from Europe give us an insight into how our election campaign looks from there. One of them says it's always exciting and a little frightening when a new emperor of the West is being chosen. That cover story is about police and the people. Just phrasing it that way suggests the way some police think people feel about them, that they are somehow not people. The story is by Attorney General Ramsey Clark as told to Mike Wallace. And finally in the book tonight, Harry Reasoner's got something that defies easy classification. It's a funny and fascinating film by Saul Bass called Why Man Creates. When we first started 60 Minutes, I always had that in my mind. Harry Reasoner goes and does the story of how they made uh, uh, Casablanca, the movie. It's low moral. You do a story on some guy who was in jail and you get him out, that's high moral. It worked. It worked for us as high moral and low moral. Linnell Jeter, for example. And Linnell Jeter. Yeah. So that that concept, I said, one, got him an audience, and two, got him prestige. You need both, or, you, or you'll end up in the Sunday afternoon ghetto. If you want to survive in this broadcast, you come to the conclusion that everybody in the world who has a, a wit of sense knows this is a business. This ain't a public service. And if you're willing to help their business, they will leave you alone. You know we made $2 billion profit in the 30 years we've been on the air? That's why they leave you alone. I'm not <laughs> dumb. 
Who did you take the proposal to? It was Dick Salant, am I correct? Now, this is another great thing. Friendly was president of CBS News at this point. He thinks it's not a very good idea. Salant replaces it. This is how six Did you discuss this with Friendly? Yeah. Not much money. Okay. Okay. Now, Salant replaces it. And Bill Leonard, who is my favorite all-time guy, was a mm -hmm. vice president under Salant. Bill goes in and explains to Salant what I want to do. Salant says, I think it's a lousy idea. Leonard says, that's funny. That's what Friendly said. So Lance said that it must be a good idea. Whatever <laughs> Friendly was for, Salant was against, vice versa. That's how we got on the air. Believe it or not, they just, so Lance said, if Friendly thinks it's a lousy idea, it's got to be a good idea. Now, I have some very big ideas right now that I want to present to this company. You know what I think is going to happen? They're going to tell me the same thing they told me 33 years ago. That's a lousy idea. Tell us about your wife, Marilyn Berger, who's been in this business herself a long time and a damn good journalist. Herself. Marilyn was uh, NBC's White House correspondent. She really made a reputation as the Washington Post diplomatic correspondent on the shuttle with uh, Kissinger all over the Middle East. Um, she once said something at a, at a lecture she gave that I, I talk about to women journalists all the time. Somebody got up and said, you're a woman in television. Don't you think there should be more women in television? She said, lady, you're wrong. I'm a reporter in television. I'm a woman when I'm not in television. I never think of myself as a woman in television. I'm a woman when I'm not on television. And uh, that's her attitude. And I, and I just think it's great. And uh, I think there's far too much of this, incidentally, Without making an issue out of it, 60 Minutes has probably more bright women working there than bright guys. The mistake, television was very late in realizing, and newspapers, how great women were as reporters. They are dynamite. I mean, you read Deborah Sontag in the Times. Um, I, you, you, you can't, they, they are not only equal to, they're better. If you start it from scratch, um, I'm always amazed <laughs> that guys got jobs in because the women are so good. So you're gender neutral in the best sense because you're saying if you're a good reporter, if you're a good storyteller, That's it. hey, then I want you on my team. When we hired Diane Sawyer, yeah. People said it was time that you hired a woman. I said, excuse me, I didn't hire a woman. I hired Diane Sawyer. And I would have hired her, her name with Tom Sawyer. I mean, it's got nothing to do with being a woman. I found a good journalist. I found Leslie Stahl. That, it's not because you're a woman. She could, her name could have been Louis Stahl. The best stories that we do is a story that I call, I didn't know that story. So when it's all over, somebody says, hey, I didn't know that. I didn't know that sleeping sickness was bigger than it, AIDS in Africa. Now, you brought up last night's broadcast. So let me, let me go into that. The racial profiling story. You know why I didn't like that story? That wasn't I didn't know that story. I knew there was racial profiling. I had arguments with Mike about that. Mike and I have a wonderful back and forth. I said, Mike, you're doing a story of a kid who went to Harvard who got racially profiled. You mean if he went to Brooklyn College, it would have been racial profiling? Plus the fact that buried in that story was a great story, and it got buried. And it was something called 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement, who have classes with black and Puerto Rican kids and tell them how to act if you're picked up by a cop. I said, that's a story. That's a, I didn't know that story. I never heard of 100 Blacks in Law Enforcement. Racial profiling is a fact of life in America. What light have we shed on that by doing this? So there's a lot of give and take, and we all have great respect for each other, so we argue a lot, and we, you know, we examine who we are and where we are, but what, the, the idea of a, of a story has got nothing to do with 
who will it appeal to? Listen, I have arguments sometimes with CBS management. You're doing too many foreign stories. I said, I never think about a foreign story or domestics. It's a story. And when it's over, hopefully, somebody says, hey, I didn't know that. That's the essence of 60 Minutes. Tell me a story. I didn't know that. And the reason I use tell me a story, I have little or no interest in issues. I've got a big interest in people who deal with issues. I'm not interested in doing a documentary on acid rain. I'd rather do one about somebody who is victimized by acid rain, or a, a mayor or a governor who has to. So there's a story there. Look, the people in the Bible were very smart. The issue was evil in the world. The story was Noah. Tell them a story. That is the end all and be all of 60 Minutes. I think the time has come, 7 o'clock every night, to pool the three networks. If you can pool a news conference, if you can pool a debate, one broadcast with rather Jennings and Brokaw on it, one as an anchor, two guys out on stories, it would be the broadcast in America instead of more, I lock you in a room and you watch rather every night. You lock me in a room and I watch Jennings every night, and you lock him in a room and he watch Broco every night, and we take a quiz at the end of the year, you don't think I don't know, I don't think you don't know. And it never was made more apparent to me than election night. <laughs> there were three anchors sitting in front of the same map, giving me the same misinformation. It all could have been a pool broadcast. The money you would save. First of all, if you take the ratings and you add up Jennings, Broco, and Rather, they come to numbers like the millionaire or survivor. You put them in one broadcast. That's how you compete with CNN and CNBC and Fox News. Now, I got a feeling at this point that's a, an idea that's maybe bigger than they want to think about. However, anything you talk about that says, you know the money you'd save? You know, it's like Roman candles going off. I want to propose that. I want to propose that we get out of debates. I want to propose that we get out of their conventions. I want to compose, uh, propose that we stop, for God's sake, calling elections, that we have no right to do that. We've got to get realistic. We're living in another era. It was, it was different. It was Cronkite versus Huntley and Brinkley. They were like, that was all there was. You want to find out what happened today, you went to them. This is where CNN really threw a hook into the networks. Because of CNN, you couldn't keep things for your evening news. You have to give it during the day to your local affiliates so they can stay competitive. In the old days, you had to wait till 7 o'clock to find out what happened. It's on all day long. There's no let's wait till Jennings or Brokaw or rather come on to find out what happened today. You know what happened today. Do it as a big one broadcast done by the three networks. I know it's radical. Do you still have the same passion 33 years later for no more? I have no idea why at age 78 I am still up for this game. I, I, I cannot answer that. I don't know what it is, but this is my life. You know the biggest dread of my life is retiring? I want to die at my desk. I don't want to die in a rowboat or in a canoe or on a tennis court. And I have no idea what it is, except it fuels me. Good service. Got it? Thank you. Thank you.